Thank you, thank you so much. It is exciting to see you in this way. I have no clue who the most of you are because I don't, I don't recognize your cars. Uh, I can't see in them from the viewpoint that I have, but it is an exciting thing to look out there and see all of you that on this beautiful, beautiful Lord's Day evening have come out to drive in church. These are indeed exciting times. And I don't know how you're, uh, I don't know how you're doing. I don't know if the quarantine is getting to you, but uh, they are certainly exciting times. I thought this morning, after I had gone home, got back into our little two-room cabin on campus uh, with my wife and I, while she was getting things around for dinner, I just kind of scrolled through my phone. I'm not good at technology, but it was amazing because I got to thinking, if nothing else, the virus has opened up avenues whereby we can access church in far different ways than we ever imagined. And I, I got to looking this morning and just quickly, uh, mostly to holiness venues, I could have listened to a sermon after the morning service here from Michigan, Missouri, Louisiana, Florida, Oklahoma, North or South Carolina, either South Dakota, Tennessee, Maryland, Indiana, Ohio, New York, Pennsylvania, I think Alabama, and I think Kentucky and Virginia. All of those states had services this morning. When this is over, we won't even have to come back to church. We can stay home and get church. Now, I'm not, I'm not suggesting that, but it's still very interesting. That, and that's not even counting. I could have gone and listened to the virtual choirs of HSBC, GBS, UBC, AWC, and PVBI all today. I could have done that. And that's not even counting the reruns of Cyber IHC. So I'll tell you what, while we seem to feel that we're pretty confined the gospel of Jesus Christ is still reaching out into areas around the world. And thank God for that. Hallelujah. But, but seriously, it is good. It's always good to come to Beavertown. Just quickly, a little infomercial, a little commercial. I need to send greetings tonight if any of them are listening to the little crowd back at Blue Knob. I've been filling in there until the virus hit, and now I'm here. But anyhow, if any of them are listening in, I know they're probably not, because in, in Blue Knob, they're still shoveling snow. But anyway, it's good to be here tonight at Beavertown. Now, they insisted I wear this overcoat. I've got to tell you, I'm not comfortable in it, but, uh, they said it's cold up here. I don't know about being cold, but I know one thing. I have been rebaptized sitting here waiting for the mailies to get done singing. But anyway, it's good to be here tonight. When, uh, when uh, the senior pastor of Beavertown asked me some time ago, or he notified me that one of these nights or one of these days, when it gets a little warmer, I'm going to have you speak here at Beavertown. And so uh, he had no more and told me that. And I was sitting down where some of you are tonight in the comfort of my car. 
And uh, as the senior pastor was preaching that day, the Lord began to speak to me and said, I just want you to remind the people of something from this scripture. So I'm calling you back to 2 Timothy chapter 1. 2 Timothy chapter 1. When he was preaching, and I've heard it preached from this platform and referred to more than once, I also heard it referred to during the cyber IHC by someone, but different people have grabbed a hold of 2 Timothy chapter 1, verse 7, where it says, For God hath not given us the spirit of fear, but of power, and of love, and of a sound Mind, And as the pastor was preaching that uh, here one day, I dropped down just a little bit below it where it continues to say, Be not thou therefore ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, nor of me, Paul said, his prisoner, but be thou partaker of the afflictions of of the gospel according to the power of God. Verse 9, who has saved us and called us with a holy calling, not according to our works, but according to his own purpose and grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus before the world began. What a tremendous scripture any time But what a tremendous scripture with all that we have been going through. I like what to me is kind of an introduction to it when in verse 7 he mentions four things, four important things, and he lists them there. Power, love, sound mind, and fear. Those four things the apostle mentions. And I got to thinking about that. God purposely mentions every one of them. Three of them are exceedingly profitable to us, and perhaps all four, but one of them can cause the others to be of less benefit. And so he warns us by saying that God hath not given us the spirit of fear. He mentions fear, but he says God didn't give that to us. In the same paragraph, he mentions what God has given us, power and love and a sound mind. Now, I got to thinking about that. What what admonition for us in what we're going through? People are, in fact, fearful. People are afraid. People are intimidated. People wonder. But God was never for a minute taken off guard. God was not at all unprepared. And he wants to remind us that he is able. And because he is able for us, we are able. I got to thinking about this when I was a little guy growing up on the farm up in Tioga County. I can remember times, I've mentioned it before, when I would go up into the upstairs bedroom at night as a little guy, and I'd go in there, and when I, as you'd say, out in the light, when I turned the light on, it was dark. And I, I would be scared. I can remember being scared. At night, when the lights were out in the farmhouse, You could hear things loud. You didn't know what they were. 
And I sometimes thought whatever they were, they were under my bed. And I can still remember kind of looking over the edge of the bed to see if anything was down there. And I've often thought if anything would have looked up at me, I wouldn't be telling it now. But I can remember being scared. I shouldn't have been scared because in the, in the presence or in the house was my dad and my mom. And dad, being an old army ranger from World War II and a little boy's hero, dad was powerful enough to protect me from anything that would come encroaching upon my territory. I should have realized that. So there was enough power there to keep me safe. Certainly there was enough love there to make me secure, to know the love of a dad and a mom and, and a family. So there was power there and love. And at least, maybe not as much as in your family, for I don't remember that any of us were valedictorians, but at least there was a measure of sound mind. At least there was an idea that they could reason their way through to take every available precaution that when their son went upstairs to his bedroom at night, it was going to be okay. He ought to be able to rest. He ought to be comfortable. He ought to be able to relax. But I can still remember being scared. Well, I want to tell you, we have a God that is powerful. We have a God that looks over our well-being. We have a God that is a big God. And the boys and girls sing about how big he is. And you and I realize how big he is. And, and we have known in yesteryear how he came on the scene and did big things for us. And we've given him praise over it. But oh, we ought never to forget when coronavirus or when pandemic or when quarantine comes and everything's different, God's the same. And God is powerful. Hallelujah. Then, of course, we are reminded that he's not only powerful, but how dare we for a moment doubt his love. Doesn't matter what we go through. Doesn't matter who we are. It doesn't even matter if tonight at drive-in church we have to sit in a Ford. God still cares about us and still loves us. And he knows all of your situation. He knows all of your particulars. He knows all of you by name. And there's not a friend like the lowly Jesus. There's not one that cares like him. And no matter what you and I go through, there's power and there's love. And then, of course, there's a sound mind for let, let the mind of Christ rule in your life. And he'll give you enough sense and he'll give you enough reason and he'll give you enough instruction that you'll see where you're at and who you are and what needs to be done about it. And if you'll walk in the light that he gives you, if you'll obey him, he'll lead you in a way that's good. Hallelujah tonight. So I go back and think, oh, it didn't really change things, although eventually I got to where I was no longer scared uh, in the upstairs bedroom. I think I might have been about 18, but I got over it. But I'm so grateful. I'm so grateful that, that uh, the apostle starts out by reminding us in the introduction that God hath not given us the spirit of fear. Don't let the fear sap you of the realization that God's power and God's love and God's reasoning for you is sufficient for every day of your life. But he goes on down here in verse 8 quickly to say that there's something we ought not to be and something that we ought to be. He says in verse 8, be not thou. And on down he says, but be thou. 
So God is reasonable with us. He tells us what we ought not to be or what we ought not to do, but he also turns around and tells us what we ought to do. He's clear to us. He reasons with us. He speaks our language. We can be understood by him and he by us. And he wants it that way because he says we are to not be ashamed. We are not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord. Now, that doesn't particularly mean that we're to listen to what he said in a testimony meeting, but it's talking about his doctrine. It's talking about his word. It's talking about his leadership. It's talking about what he would speak to you about. And he says, don't be ashamed of that. Don't be intimidated by that. Don't be embarrassed by that. And so you and I need to cling to him and lean on him and draw nigh to him. And you'll find that he speaks to you because he cares. And he tenderly instructs us in a way that we can go. I remember a time when I needed somebody to care. I remember a time when I needed somebody to step in and help me. I didn't know where to go. I didn't know who to call on. But God knew, and God came. And that's the miracle of divine grace, because he goes on to say that while we're not to be ashamed of the testimony of our Lord, or his people, Paul said, even if we be a prisoner as he was, we are to be partakers of the afflictions of the gospel. That doesn't mean the gospel's a hard way, but it does mean that no matter what it, what it presents us in life, we are to be partakers of obeying God, walking in the gospel. We're not ashamed of the gospel because it's the power of God unto salvation. And he goes on to say it here. He said, because according to the power of God, the gospel in verse 9 has saved us. Hallelujah. What a day when Jesus came to take my sins away. What a day when Jesus reached out to me to save me. I can remember a time when I needed help, I would have been embarrassed to admit it. I wouldn't have wanted perhaps you to know it. But I've thought, you know, you ever stop to think that in a, in a setting like this, uh, I, I can't see beyond your windshields. I, I don't know who's sitting in the red cars opposed to the white cars, to the black cars, to those that are green. I don't know. But the good thing about it is that God is not at a loss to understand and identify every single one of us. He sees you exactly where you're at now. And so you don't have to be embarrassed about anything. You don't have to wonder as far as in regards to the rest of us about anything. I can guarantee you, though, that if through all that we're going through, in all the differences that we're experiencing, if in that we've come to realize, you know what, in the changing scenes of life, I need to get serious about God. I need to think about my soul. I need to consider doing business with God. One night he edged up to me in a revival meeting I couldn't see him like I could see the flags of the pulpit or the preacher, but standing in a crowd, lonely in my own sin, needing a champion to step up beside me, needing someone to plead my cause and help me with my questions and deliver me from my sin. When I deserved to be stiff-armed away, Jesus came and as it were said, come unto me, come unto me all ye that labor and are heavy laden. And I didn't know the theology, but he was saying, I'll save you. And I didn't know it doctrinally, but I needed a savior. I needed the Christ of Calvary. I needed the blood 
and what it could do for my lost soul. And it says here that if you and I are willing to, to draw near to God and become partakers of the afflictions of the gospel, it will result in the fact that he saves us. He came to save us. In verse 9, who has saved us and then called us with a holy calling because he saves us that he wants to sanctify us. He forgives us of sin that he can do a work in our heart as we obey him and, and surrender to him and consecrate our lives to him. He'll come and cleanse our heart and fill our heart and sanctify us and take away the bent to sin and the taproot of sin. And he said it's a holy calling, not according to our works, not because we're related to somebody or not because of our last name, or not because of our status or our achievements, not our works, but he says, but according to his purpose and his grace, which was given us in Christ Jesus. And then in closing, what he says about that, it excites me because he said this was before the world began. I can't understand that. I can't wrap my mind around it. But God had an old rugged cross in place before the world stood. God had you and I in mind before he made it all. And God is still interested in us and nothing has changed his plan. And the truth is nothing has prevented its happening for God is using means that we could have never imagined to get the message of the old rugged cross out to a lost and a dying world. And you and I, you and I have the, have the lovely invitation tonight that we can indeed come to him. For he would not desire that we be nominated or driven by a spirit of fear, but one that recognizes from God power and love and of a sound mind. What a joy to be a Christian tonight. What a joy to serve God. Let's continue to obey him. God bless your hearts. Amen. Thank you so much, Brother Plank, for sharing your heart with us this evening. I so appreciated that encouraging message. And it has been a delight to have you with us here this evening. And as we close the service here tonight, uh, we're going to close by singing a chorus in the, uh, that we have in our chorus book that we like to sing around here. It says, there are no boundaries, no limits to what God can do. There are no boundaries, no limits to what God can do. As you would leave tonight, uh, if you would like prayer, uh, you're welcome to pull next to the carport and we would be happy to pray with you. Uh, don't forget as you would leave, our parking attendants have offering buckets and tonight's offering will go towards our building fund. Uh, don't forget on uh, Tuesday is a special day here at Beavertown with the blood drive. Uh, sign up to give blood if you haven't done so and uh, make sure you come out for the, the, the community meals, the take home meals as well. Don't don't forget on Wednesday, of course, we'll be right back here at 730 for drive-in church. 
do your best to be inviting others. And uh, let's have a closing word of prayer. Heavenly Father, we thank you, Lord, that your power is more than able to help us to live a life that's victorious. And we're so thankful, oh God, that you want to help each one of us this week to live a life that is victorious over sin. We ask, Lord, that you would be with these people tonight as they would leave. Keep us safe throughout this week. Bring us back together on Wednesday night. And, Lord, for the help that you give, we'll be careful to give you praise. In Jesus' name, amen. Our parking attendants are coming right now to dismiss you. Please be patient and uh, allow them to dismiss you in an orderly fashion. Thank you so much for coming tonight. God bless you. You are dismissed.